Hello and welcome back to Attention Span Labs. My name is Mike DeBaggio and I'm so glad you could join me today. I wanted to start this video by saying to my Western Christian friends, Christ is risen. And to those uh, Orthodox and all, the, all others following the Eastern calendar, uh, I also want to say Christ is risen. Uh, but uh, I want to also wish you a continued uh, blessed and fruitful Lent full of uh, prayer, fasting, which I know is hard, it's very hard for me, and almsgiving. So today we're going to get back into the videos. I haven't made a video in a little while, um, but I've been doing a lot of painting, a lot of building models, customizing, uh, doing uh, terrain building and so forth, and preparing for Historicon. Uh, we've also been blessed by uh, meeting uh, a new person who has joined our, our wargaming group. We meet on a, on a regular basis now. We've been continuing to play the Jean Dao campaign, which uh, if you've been following the Splendor of Fire website, you know what that's all about. If not, in brief, it's an it's a online sci-fi campaign being run by um, a consortium of players from around the world. We have groups, uh, my group here in Pennsylvania, we have groups in Texas, um, in the United Kingdom, uh, Australia, and we're all just running in this sort of, uh, we're, we're building the world as we fight over it. And it's a sci-fi campaign based loosely on the Boxer Rebellion. So we're going to talk to you about some of that today. Um, and we're also going to look at Mark Mondragon's Iron Core universe, as you can see with these Eisenkern stormtroopers in front of you. Um, and now the... I don't know too much about so th this. Uh, I got these figures you're looking at in front of you, um, and I'm going to show you plenty more that are not painted. But I got these about ten years ago. Got them down at a nice game store uh, in Chantilly, Virginia, which is now closed, which is a shame because I used to hit that store all the time when I would go down on vacation to the Outer Banks or or wherever I was going down that way. Um, and these were actually the first figures I painted with contrast paints. When contrast paints first came out, my wife said that I should go and buy some and do them because she had heard good things about them and she was tired of me not painting miniatures. Uh, and uh, So anyway, I slapped these on. These don't look like my usual running. I was experimenting with them. And I think I painted them all in like a couple hours, uh, but I really, um, oh my goodness, that one guy's missing a shoulder pad. I just noticed that. I hope I'm able to find that. Um, hmm. Anyway, uh, I really like these these uh, figures. They're they're obviously a kind of space German, you know. They're I would say World War One, World War Two uh, Germans in space, and you'll see that more with the other figures I'm, I'm going to show you. But these are from they were originally uh, these are as I said designed. They're the brainchild of a of a gentleman named Mark Mondragon, and uh, but I don't think he he paid someone to have them sculpted. He helped design them, but. He wrote the, the universe that they're set in. And there's the Iron Core Empire, the Eisenkern, which, as I said, they're space Germans. Uh, there is, I think, some, there's something called the Protectorate, which I think are space Soviets. Um, and there's an alien race, I think, called the Shadowkish, which, uh, as far as I'm aware, almost nothing was written about. I can't find anything about it on the Internet either. But these miniatures in front of you, these are a multi-part plastic kit. They are 28mm. Uh, they're... Um, towards the heroic scale, but they're not on that giant 32 millimeter kind of scale. Uh, that modern 40k ones are in, but they're still very compatible with um, 40k miniatures and modern ones as well as old ones. I, I use them with my old 40k ones. Um, I use them with uh, all the other War Games Atlantic miniatures and um, the Nightmare miniatures and all the other minis I have, and I think they look very good. Um, these particular ones, all this set came, these are from a, a set, series, uh, manufacturer was War Games Factory. They are a multi-part plastic kit. They have some nice poses, but they're pretty limited. They all have the exact same weapon. It looks like they're kind of a machine gun, actually, which is cool. But uh, in more recent years, I think starting in 2021, the line was uh, uh, licensed uh, to War Games Atlantic, which I've done videos on before, and I, I, I really love and I'm, I'm going to show you some of the modern War Games Atlantic figures, and I'm also going to show you some of the later sets 
of these that were released through War Games Factory. So you can take a look at them and see whether they suit your fancy for uh, near future or far future gothic space, grimdark terror, sci-fi, uh, uh, war games, whatever you like to play. Well, I like these quite a bit. Um, so we'll take a look at some more uh, the more limited edition War Games Foundry sets, which most people don't have, including Heavy Weapons Teams, a command unit. And we'll look at some of the, we'll look at, have one set of the War Games Atlantic ones, and actually have the Panzer Jaegers. They have two sets. They have uh, these, uh, which are, they're remodeled and they're re-equipped, so they have a different, a better variety of weapons. Uh, and they're called the Eisenkern Stormtroopers, as I mentioned. And the, uh, but the one set I have is the Eisenkern, Eisenkern Panzer Jaegers which are similarly armored, but uh, I think they're like a lighter armor. And I'm not sure whether they have different weapons or not, but they're modeled with several of them. Uh, you could make them female too. Though, um, by that I mean they have heads that you can see with like long hair and ponytails and so forth. But the armor is not uh, obviously female. And So anyway, uh, I want to talk to you, since I don't know too much about the Iron Core universe, I want to talk to you about my use of them in my universe. I'm a, I'm a custom customizer. I like to homebrew army lists, and I have many of what uh, uh, newcomers that are only, only know about Warhammer would call Imperial Guard regiments, but they're not Imperial Guard regiments at all in, the, in our in our setting in our uh, sidereal Christianity setting that we have. We've been building slowly through uh, over time through gameplay through the Splendor of Fire. I encourage you to check that out. I'm going to read you some more about the, the 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 planetary interplanetary empire, where these troops come from, uh, the Empire of Arkpolon. Uh, and these ones in particular are, I use these as Archie naval infantry. Now naval infantry are, uh, they are they are full full infantry units, but they're sort of uh, under equipped. They're they're well, I guess I shouldn't say they're under-equipped. They're not. They're not mechanized. They have. They have good equipment. They have good training, and but they're they're sort of impromptu troops, which are used for defending uh, star bases for landing zones when they're in the employ of of beach master units. Uh, beach masters are you know they they'll land to secure a planetary landing zone, um, but like the actual like planetary assaults are. Uh, in the Arky way, our company, or they're, it's carried out by the Army, right? The Navy transports in there, but the Army does the fighting on the ground. So these are essentially a kind of Marine, um, but they're not meant for prolonged fighting on the ground. They're meant for secure, they're meant for doing, you know, they, as I said, they secure the landing zones, they'll, they'll board ships, they'll, they'll do anti-piracy actions and boarding space stations and stuff like that. And they'll secure naval depots on the surface, airfields and so forth. So that's what I use these for. And we're going to talk about more about the Arqualon in, in a minute here. And here you can see half of one of the War Games Factory command squads. Now I got these, um, I don't know, I'm going to say about four, four or five years ago uh, when they were when they were going out. You know, it has to be, well, geez, it's... 2021 is three years ago now, so it would have to be probably four or five years ago when they were going out of production, and uh, they actually had a sale on them. I didn't, I hadn't known about them, that they had anything new, anything other than the stormtroopers for a while. But I picked these up in a, in two heavy weapon boxes for very cheap, uh, very affordable, uh, and these have these are the same designs. I, I left the one of my stormtroopers, the naval infantry painted guys here. To, as you can see, the um, they have the same style armor. Uh, different poses, some different heads, that much more customization. As you can see, these guys have different weapons. They have submachine guns, they have sniper rifles, um, they have uh, carbines. Uh, you could model them with pistols, knives, and so forth. Let's see, there's some variation in the heads um, with the with the night vision gear with the extra optics on them, and you have a uh, this actually came with more, more miniatures, but we're going to focus on this unit because uh, these are all on single bases. But the, the focus, focal point here is a commander and his, and his soft cap is combination cover. And 
he has a, a mantle that it, it goes around the armor, as you can see. He's got the iron cross on him. Yeah, so he is uh, he's an officer, I suppose. Uh, and here's your platoon sergeant. Now he did come with he you can see he has he's carrying a flagpole. And there is a flag attached to this pole, which is a as I said, a kind of space Imperial German flag. In fact, here it is. Now I snipped that off because these are going to be troops from Arquilon, as I mentioned. And I'll read about read to you plenty about that, but um, they're not space Germans by any means, so it's a very nice flag. But I snipped it off, I'll use it for something else. And I'm going to use some, some cloth uh, or printed flags. So, but there's your platoon sergeant. And these other guys here, these are uh, two man, there's canonically, I guess, sniper teams. They, you could use them as like in squad sharpshooters. So there's your, but anyway, there's your, you got one spotter and one guy with a sniper rifle and then for each team. And there are different poses, and as like I said, they're multi pose. They're, they're nice hard plastic sets, and uh, you can make model them in various different ways. Though, you know, there's definitely the with the the combination of the shoulder pads, um, the gorget around the around the throat area, and the the weapons, the way the hands are. You are somewhat limited in the degrees of freedom you have as far as posing them. I, I modeled these very closely off of what was on the box, but I really like these, so. All right, let's take a look at the other part of the command squad, which includes um, some larger bases. So here you see again next to a painted example of a stormtrooper, this is a medic. And he has not, he's not wearing a helmet. He is in violation of the Space Geneva Conventions carrying a weapon, but that's okay. Um, most interesting thing, you know, he has some medical pouches and stuff on him. He has some extra gear. But the most interesting thing about him, I think, is he has this mule. So it's, that's what they call in the package. And I think it's, I think it's abbreviated M-U-L-E. But obviously, based off of, uh, visually based off one of those Boston Dynamic robot, um, robot dog things. But this, this is a very practical and useful uh, item to have. Very characterful for the table, too. It's, it's good to see. Usually, you don't see medics with uh, with you know. In real life, they'd have various stretcher bearers to go with the corpsman. But this this the dog, the robot dog, is carrying the, the stretcher here. And you know, so you got the gurney here. This looks like a very uncomfortable slab, but presumably there's blankets or something stored somewhere. And these are the the movable the cage that comes down to secure the patient on there. And you can imagine there's some diagnostic tools and stuff. Built in there, maybe even an auto surgeon. We also have a similar sized base, the platoon communications officer, as I'm uh, calling him the information support officer or signalman. He has the same standard arm as everybody else. He comes with. Uh, you'll see this this particular instrument a lot here it, uh, you could I mean it looks to me like more like a radar unit but since he's labeled communication officer I guess it's supposed to be uh, an, like a communication antenna but uh, I see this as he's setting up um, a portable battlefield sensor maybe a multi-mode sensor with yeah, it's got radar, maybe it has seismic sensors and it's on the ground. It's got various different kinds, maybe, maybe even it has passive radar with a millimeter wave. Might have motion detectors in it. But he maybe he sets up several of these. And with the control box powering for each one, and he could set them up and, sorry, secure the, you know, put them in some brush behind rocks and so forth. Um, and he has this little control box, which I think you can see there. He's got the, sc uh, the screen. We we'll actually have the screen on backwards. Oh well, it's supposed to be this way. But um, see, so he has a little control box and he's setting it up. You can see he's calling in for an airstrike or coordinating drones. Um, or he's, you know, 
beginning uh, working with uh, some other teams we're going to see later to set up a, a, a defensive network of sentry guns. But this is also a very, very cool piece. Um, radio men uh, are somewhat seldom represented, even though they'd be very important, even more important in the future. Right? You got to get the. But these guys, I figure, they're not. They don't, maybe they don't just. Uh, they're not just uh, in in charge of getting encrypted messages through, but they're they're uh, analyzing uh, battlefield attack patterns. They're controlling drones. They're you know calling in airstrikes along with the forward observers, which we'll see again. So this is a uh, but uh, yeah another important part of the command squad. I like him a lot. All right, now I'm going to take you into the. Oh, no, what we have one more of them. Here's uh, the forward observer team. Oh, uh, one one other thing I want to show you too. I forgot. I didn't glue them on the base because there's not really room for them. But you saw the medical mule for the medic. But each of these teams also has their own mule. Now these mules are a little different. I modeled them. You could, they have a bit of a different head. They sort of have a small radar or guidance unit on with a camera and a sensor on as well. Um, they also have a different cage up top. But you could you could model these, and I intend to add some stuff to it. Like uh, you, know, you can see them putting their field packs on there, blankets, um, rifles, you know, bombs, whatever. But these are supposed to be assigned to each of these. They don't really fit on the space provide it kind of do um, so I'm going to model these on separate bases and then use them not necessarily attached to these but to, to different units as I feel like it but so yeah so there's the the mules and uh, this also with the mule is is this two-man uh, forward observer forward air controller team and they're setting up what's you know a laser designator and it also has this is why I think these are radar units rather than communication units because they have one too and maybe they're they're sitting up a uh, um, you know, that could be a laser designator, it could be some kind of multi multi-spectral thing in this guy. You know, he has a binocular sighted in, he's painting the target and, you know, sending the instructions back to their aircraft, to their drones. Like they could, he could also be, you see, he has a, I gave him a head with a, oops. He had this, uh, the laser does he has like a, a secondary visor over his, that maybe he's seeing through telepresence through some drones. He's commanding. So another very characterful piece. You know, if you play bolt action uh, rather than, than 40K, uh, you, know, you don't really see forward air controllers or anything like that. But, you know, bolt action has, you have your spotters, your your artillery observer, and your air observer teams. You have those. And, um, you know, so this is a nice add if you're playing them more, um, what's, what's the word? I want to say realistic for sci-fi, but a more sort of fully featured, in-depth kind of game that takes you know into consideration real things other than, other than just shooting each other with rifles forty thousand years from now. But you know, I think these would be if you do play forty k, these would be great Imperial Guard units. Um, or uh, so un unfortunately, I do want to say that War Games Atlantic does not make these, so you can't get these anymore. You can get them secondhand, I assume. From somewhere you're probably going to pay quite a bit for them but they, these were the last of the war games factory ones so they don't make them anymore hopefully war games atlantic will come out with these sets and here are your three-man heavy weapon teams it's a, a multi-mortar probably rocket assisted uh, it's guided as you can see it has another radar dish and wires hooked up to it they also give you some interesting things like boxes filled with mortar canisters. I don't know how this one actually works because I think this is the actual mortar projectile they put on it. So that um, like it blasts uh, three shots at a time or something. There's the, there's the loader there. You can see he's carrying a reload there. There's the controller with his, his control panel. He, it actually is like a little tablet, a little data slate there. He's like programming it in, programming coordinates, and of course the guy with the binoculars. So just like the last one, the command squad, the, these are also not produced by War Games Atlantic. 
hopefully they will produce these as well because these are excellent kits. They were they were a little fiddly to put together, honestly, especially the next one I'm going to show you. Um, but yeah, every platoon's got to have its own you know, organic mortar and maybe have several of them actually. But especially like a, um, a rapid fire, maybe guided mortar would be very effective to have. Yeah, even one of could lay down a lot. If it could fire multiple shots and then quickly pick up and get on its way uh, before counter battery fire comes in. And it's light enough for, for three men to carry with all its ammunition. All right, let's move on. This is what this is. They call this an anti aircraft gun, and I call it a, a, a remote um, sector defense gun. In the Arqualon forces, you're gonna, you have. Uh, doctrine is for at least uh, one of these to be equipped with every every platoon, with uh, heavier platoons. But um, increasingly, as the war on Genau goes on, in other uh, areas they're found to be very effective, and they have probably three per platoon, so they can decide at least one per squad. These are also radar guided, and they're hooked into the local sensor network. So I didn't bother to put them in there. So they're feeding off of other systems. But it's actually so it's a quad. You can see it's a quad barreled. They look like the smart guns from Aliens, and there's four of them. So I I, I think they're like a an 18 millimeter or so. We call it a very light auto cannon, um, and they fire flèche rounds or explosive rounds, and it's a it's a they can be sent up to be automated. Here I can see the guys calibrating it for test fire. You got your spotter with the binoculars. Reloader with the extra canisters, extra canisters there in the box, the control box, and then the controller here programming it, targeting it. It, it does have handles so it can be fired manually if necessary, if everything else breaks down. And it does have has a gun shield. Uh, the gun shield doesn't provide much cover for everybody else, though. This is why I say it's mainly only if the guy's standing directly behind it. So as I say, it's not... Um, Probably not meant to be, you know, fired manually only in a pinch, but it does have optical sensor camera on it, and these are uh, uh, multi-role devices that are useful against um, infantry, armored infantry, especially the fire explosive rounds. But they're they're mainly um, they're used for for defending against low flying aircraft, in particular uh, small drones, suicide drones, which we also know as missiles, right? Uh, it's not reinvent the wheel. They're just uh, disposable missiles, things that are moving too fast, and they're just sort of turned on, and and you let them go. You let them go to work, and they fire a large vault. I think these these canisters probably hold about 100 rounds of explosive or flèche, and they're made to shred uh, lightly armored targets over long distance and put out a lot of flak so that they can, if, if they don't um, get a direct hit on on a fast moving dodging and weaving drone, they can at least shred it or damage its optics, or uh, they can basically act as, you know, like a phalanx gun, a sea whiz gun um, for, for missiles coming in. Probably not hyperconnect penetrators that are traveling on a flat trajectory, but any kind of pop-up weapons that are made to take advantage of, uh, of uh, you know, weaker top armor, they have to shoot up and then come down, you know, they're, they're, they're more visible than a, a straight line shot, so could fill the sky with lead to do some active active countermeasures on them. That's the sector defense gun. Now, they call a light anti-tank gun. Now, this is a gun shield. The other thing, that ain't no gun shield. This is a gun shield, as you can see. We got an ammo box, and there's ammo to fill up the whole thing if you want. You got the loader actually loading it in. Gunner calling for another one, and then you know you got your you dude with the binoculars. Uh, and I, I'm going to treat this as as a, a medium rail gun, uh, sort of thing. And this would be certainly be carried by a mule or two. Maybe one for the ammo, one for the gun. Quickly negotiate terrain, but it's got. Uh, this is is. Could be fired remotely, like pretty much all their weapons, I think, but is meant to be fired, you know, pretty much manually. And this is um, it gives infantry units much needed direct fire capability that they that they don't have. 
It has a muzzle brake, so I don't know if it would be a railgun. Electrothermal, can electrothermal cannon, then. You know, it fires uh, very high, high velocity uh, anti armor shells, explosive shells, squash heads. Things for a different variety of, for, not just for knocking out um, up to medium vehicles, but for uh, laying down. Um, uh, uh, you know, suppressing fire on on bunkers, uh, penetrating enemy structures. Also, you can it, it consider this um, if this is a very light auto cannon. This is a very heavy anti material rifle. So you can see it as like as as sniping um, even even large large armored vehicles from a distance, or knocking out their engines or uh, disabling their propulsion. So that's the heavy weapon teams. And these are the Heiser and Kern Panzerjäger. Now these ones are, are they're also a hard plastic multi-part multi -part kit, but they are available now. You can buy these um, straight from the manufacturer. These ones are made by War Games Atlantic, and they do also make a Stormtrooper pack. As I alluded to before, these have a much um, greater variety of weapons. You can see there's more, more of a standard rifle versus the, I'll put them up there, the, the big machine gun style uh, weapon that the uh, other ones came with. Uh, you also got these larger uh, they're laser rifles, battle rifles, I don't know what they're supposed to be. Um, and then a large, even even bigger than the original. Let me get one kneeling down so you can see a comparison. Similar sized but redesigned. And I think this would this is going to be just a different variety of uh, squad automatic weapon, automatic heavy automatic rifle of some kind, smart gun. So certainly more of a variety if you don't want your entire unit equipped with these machine guns. Then they come with pistols and submachine guns. Some of the other ones they also have some different heads like these night vision heads, and these guys have targeters on them. But otherwise, uh, similar style armor, same backpacks, different heads. But I think that's a th um, the Panzer Jaeger heads are just different. And as I mentioned, they come with some all the exposed heads, and they can can wear soft caps or helmets. All the exposed heads are women in these sets. But I don't think there's a major there's a significant difference in terms of body type. Certainly, I I'm treating mine as male. I don't, looking at the legs there, you know, there's not, you know, they've all got the sculpted buttocks there, but then, you know, so did the originals. So I don't think there's any obvious tell that they are, any of them are women. And they're not, uh, you know, they're not explicitly supposed to be all women either. But interestingly, it, it says the, the Panzer Jaeger are, you know, they're um, sort of taking, uh, Panzer Hunter, literally, uh, that they are they're out to destroy um, enemy mechanized units. But they don't have any heavy weapons, which suggests to me that these are like in the Iron Core universe anyway. That these are you know rail guns or they're you know heavy, high power lasers or something like that. Not these ones, but the other bigger weapons. And they don't have any rocket launchers. They don't have any, any like what I what I would consider to be. Uh, large bore cannons or missiles or anything that you'd think in the traditional anti-tank realm. But these are very nice. Uh, you do get <clears throat> zoom out so you can see this. This is the War Games Atlantic box, and you get twenty multi-part hard plastic miniatures and. 28 millimeter. Here's the back side of the box. So you get uh, the four uh, four sprues with uh, five legs and torso set torso sets on each sprue. And it says this set is compatible with the Eisenkern stormtroopers. Now that doesn't mean, by the way, that it's not compatible with their other sets. I mean, uh, unfortunately, even their death field sets are not going to be a perfect match with each other because you know they're sent to be different sizes. But these, if you play, if you're playing some other kind of sci-fi game, 
Um, you want to do Star Grunt and make your own forces, as, as I do if you're playing Xenos Ramp. And they're, if you're, if you, these would make a good Deathfields army. Not that that game actually exists. Uh, they keep threatening to put out rules for it. but So I like these very much. And let me know what you think of them, because I think they're a very attractive set of science fiction miniatures. They look kind of like a combination between historical troops with, uh, and with like, they have, you know, the Star Wars, they look like they're wearing Fritz helmets, but with the Star Wars Stormtrooper helmet underneath. Hell, they could make, um, now that I think about it, I hadn't thought about this at all, but they could make good uh, Star Wars troops, either Imperial Special Troops, or if you're doing Star Wars miniature gaming in like an old era of their old Republic, like something, you know, Tales of the Jedi era or something like that, they might make nice troops for that. They could be, um, you know, near future modern, future wars, post-apocalyptic stuff. I just want to talk just for a second before I tell you about the force they represent on my battlefields, which are the uh, armies of Arqualon. Before I tell you about that, I want to mention about the paint job. Now, as I said, these were the very first ones I ever painted with contrast paints, and I was kind of getting the hang of it. Um, and they're splotchy, but um, when I first put it on, of course, I didn't under understand really you know, how to do it. Um, so generally, when I paint them, I don't paint them to look like this, uh, because you want to get it in the recesses and shading rather than have these kind of splotches. But as I was doing it, I, I liked the splotches and I started to play up the splotches. This, the, their basic color, uh, these are very quick to paint. I, their all over color is just um, Citadel Skeleton Horde. You can also use the um, speed paint equivalent, which is some like skeleton bone or something like that. But they make a great arid environment camouflage. Uh, and so I like the splotchiness. Like I, I um, you, know, you could say, well, you could do a better job of that. And, and I could, certainly. But I, I kind of like it. There's a couple things I might tighten up on them. One thing I really want to do is I want to give them an, an oil wash to bring them up to snuff with my other uh, armies of Arqualon units, which are from Anvil Industry. But I, I like this because to me, this is, it's not shading, it's camouflage. And the idea that I had for these as I was painting them, I was like, boy, that looks like a phototropic effect. And what I mean by that is, you imagine they build these, uh, the armor out of a certain impact plastic or it's metal or something, but it's impregnated with this, with layer, with layer that actually it's kind of an active camouflage. It's not something it doesn't use cameras or mirrors or anything like that, but it, it like a chameleon, it uh, receives input naturally from the environment, light reflected off of its surroundings. And so the, the actual canonical explanation of this is that uh, this is their armor has, has this sort of chameleonic thing in it. It's not powered or anything it's a natural part of the of the metal and it's a phototropic response so whatever sort of environment they, they're in it, it gradually adapts to it now and that's why it doesn't look like your standard camouflage pattern with you know it doesn't have a discrete pattern with splotches or flectarns little dots so it doesn't have the or you know the gridded or anything like that it's very spot but that it's reflecting the light the the environment they're in at the time and it's not perfect it's not uh, yeah and of course there are blue shoulder pads um, well <laughs> doesn't do much for their camouflage does it now I put them on there purely for an aesthetic sense for me because I was like boy I want them to look they need something else to pop otherwise they're just very otherwise I'm just painting bolt action minis again <laughs> um, so that bit of colors for me but the dead my, my thought is that they can like pull them on and off and that, that this one designates them as naval infantry of, of a particular unit. Yeah, but that's how that works. Those are That's the phototropic gear, except for parts of the armor that can have it, like the antenna there. I, I'm not sure whether that's an antenna or a waste heat. I, I think it's probably part of their power plant. These, don't, these actually appear to be powered armor. 
come to think of it, those aren't just like backpacks. Those seem to be the, um, and these would be decent space marine proxies for like for a lighter power armor, but they sort of have that Far Cry kind of kind of like combination of like a Far Cry with the World War II German with the uh, Imperial Stormtroopers. I don't know. Let me know what you think of these if you like these sets. Um, if you're going to go out and get some yourself, uh, I do recommend. You know, I actually have a, an extra set of the heavy weapons teams, and I don't know that I'm going to build or paint any more of them. I don't know that I need that many of them. Um, the heavy weapons teams, again, is uh, these three. So I could be induced to part with them. And, I, I you know, if, if, if you want to build your own army of Arquilon, let me know in the comments and submit to me your your proposal, and maybe I'll send them to you. Because God knows I have a lot of miniatures already, and you can't get these anymore. So, all right. Now, while you look at them, put this, this interesting, this mule here, because I think that's a very interesting unit too. So, while you look at these guys, I'll read to you about the, um, about Arkelon, which is the world that they're from in, in the Jandao campaign and the sci ongoing sci-fi battles we've been, been running. Um, and I did post this on the Splendor of Fire website. If you're not familiar with it, go check out Splendor of Fire, S-P-L-E-N-D-O-R, the American spelling, O-F-F-I-R-E dot X-Y-Z. Um, it's our collaborative gaming magazine for the Inhoc Signal Society, which is a union of Christian war gamers. <clears throat> So this fits in with our uh, our universe that with the the Shandao campaign um, is in the wider universe, and we've just been building up. Um, so if you want to join us, uh, there's a link on the website to get invited to our to our Gilded chat server, and you can contribute to the website as well. Since time immemorial, Arquilon has been one of the great bastions of humanity. Competing legends hold that the world was terraformed by the first great wave of settlers from Earth or that it was seated with human slaves by the adversary who won their freedom even before the defeat of the Reticulans. Perhaps both are true. In any event, Arquilon was venerable even at the founding of the old Solomani Imperium. Ectin the Great afforded it special rights in recognition of its ancient glory, including the rights of salvage, hyperspace jetsam, and treasure trove, notably giving it sole claim over any stargates, space hulks, and antecessor artifacts in the system. The great world was even afforded the rare rights of Imperial Soul, by which Arquilon was free to independently, co independently colonize and rule other bodies in the system, and Fleet and Ferry, which permitted the Archie to raise their own fleets and armies and transport them off-world without notice or permission from the Emperor. The major reason for Arquilon's timeless significance is because it is one of the hub worlds of the Pontus Shell, sitting astride some of the most important stable hyperspace corridors in human space. As such, it has figured prominently in galactic history, even during the inevitable cycles of civilizational decay and collapse, which even the proud Archie are not immune to. For most of the last millennium, Arquilon has been a third-rate power at best, a jewel in the crown of other conquerors rather than its own master. But much has changed in the last two centuries, beginning with the Andrevin Crusade, which ended, ended the domination of the petty foreign oligarchs and restored the, the planetary monarchy. Amid its cultural renaissance, Arquilon has become a first-rate power once again, as proved by victories against its human rivals in the Pontus Shell and against the alien Nevoir at Saharduin. In the crisis on Jandao, the Archies see a challenge worthy of them and a chance to reclaim their ancient mantle as leaders of humanity. Thus, the Emperor dispatched an entire Takma, roughly equivalent to the old galactic standard service group of 16 million men, to destroy the Blessed Concordance insurrection. Alas, the bulk of the fleet did not arrive before the Night of Comets, which you'll have to read about on the website, leaving only a handful of advanced units in position to carry out the fight. The Archie have concentrated their forces in the Interzolia region, which again, you can read about on the website. And there they formed the nucleus of the 80 Power Alliance forces there. Arquilon's planetary type is terrestrial with a surface gravity of 1.14 g. Its atmosphere is categorized 1A with human breathable gas, ideal pressure and temperature. Climate is variable frigid through tropical with intermittent polar icing. Surface coverage is 4 to 1 ocean to land. Biosphere, 
probably terraformed and DNA-based native life. The demonym of the uh, of Archelon uh, is Archie. That's what the people are referred to. And its governance is imperial, led by the ruling house of Andrevin. The armies raised on Arquilon must rate among the finest in the Pontichel. Bes besides an ancient and honorable martial tradition, Arquilon and its moons provide a versatile and autarkic industrial base, free from the stultifying control of the consensus of Moravec in its court of reason. Arquilon's navy, numbering tens of thousands of fighting ships, supports one of the most extensive and sophisticated logistical systems in the Imperial military. These factors allow them to field more expensive and resource-intensive formations, including mechanized infantry, exo-armored heavy infantry, and interface landing units. Archi forces are therefore more technologically advanced than the galactic average, with a, mo with a mobility rivaling that of the Void Knight legions. Besides this level of technical sophistication, one of the most notable deviations from the contemporary standards is that the Archi eschew beam weapons in favor of projectile arms. Whether in the form of the rugged and simple caseless autoguns or the more complex and expensive mag rifles, projectile weapons are favored for their reliable performance in all weather and environments, whereas the added logistical burden is easily taken up by the Archi Supply Corps. Laser and particle beam weapons are still employed where they are better suited, however, including in sniping rolls, anti-aircraft, and void-borne operations. Because of their more complicated supply train and their focus on combined arms, the Archie consider the brigade, rather than the regiment, or columnus, to be the smallest formation capable of long-term independent operation. A typical interface dropship brigade deployed for off-world operations might include a regiment of light infantry, armavants, two heavy exo-armored or mechanized infantry regiments, an armored support company, and two atmospheric aviation squadrons, typically one combatant and one transport. Battlefield artillery is usually provided from orbit, but when heavy artillery concentrations are needed on the ground, they are typically organized at the divisional level. And I have some stuff that you can read more about, but uh, a sample Archie Infantry Company with their table of organization and equipment. And uh, now I'm going to finish up by reading about the Archie forces on Shandau. So while most of the advanced forces that had landed on Jandao are in the Interzoli region, headquartered in, in Lanziago, with forward elements on the frontier. During the Night of Comet, several more units landed at the Lost Hope spaceport and are, and are isolated there by enemy attacks on Fire Island. Among the most important units are the aforementioned 11th Arquilon Interface Regiment, which I gave a sample of, which you can read. Look, if you want to read the TONE, check out the website. The 99th and, and 4,452nd Naval Infantry Battalions, Naval Beach Master and Construction Group 4, the 64th Arquilon Dromothestra, Dromothestra being a name uh, that um, a specific Archi word uh, that refers to an armored cavalry brigade. See, uh, in Arquilon, they don't have horses, they have droms, which are, I guess, like genetically engineered camels, um, hence Dromothestra and various elements of His Imperial Majesty's Somuz and Cataphracts, which is an elite armor brigade, so they're, they're walkers and tanks. So. I hope you enjoyed that uh, little bit of insight into my homebrew armies, and I do have uh, different units and vehicles for those other units, those other types, which I will show and go into some more detail with. And maybe I'll put out a PDF if you're interested. I would very much like to know if you're interested. Uh, if you like these kind of uh, videos, it's uh, very important that um, you like them on YouTube. You know, hit the thumbs up button. Uh, still, most of my viewers are, are not subscribed, so I would appreciate a subscription and, and to, most of all to share with your friends, share them on your own local game groups and stuff like that. And, um, I hope to do a lot more videos on my my homebrew armies here. So thank you uh, once again uh, for coming back to spend a little bit of time with me. Um, let me know what you think of the miniatures. What you, let me know what you think about the, the Jean Dao campaign or the, our universe, of, uh, our sidereal Christianity universe, um, or, or the forces of Arquilon and their organization. I'd be uh, very grateful to hear from you, and especially if you have your, your own um, 
you, I want to hear about your own homebrew armies. Well, wow. I was privileged to be get started at a time when everybody made their own homebrew army for everything, <coughs> um, for every fictional thing that wasn't like historical wargaming. Um, and I miss that. I miss that people don't do that anymore uh, as much. But I know there are a lot of clever and creative people out there who do do that. So I would like to hear from you. With that, I must say goodbye. Uh, good night. God bless. Attention Span Labs, signing off. Mm -hmm.